What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network for a reading of the ethics of money production by the Jörg Guido Holzmann and published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much to both of them. Uh, today, part eight, or chapter eight, on legalized falsification. Part one, legalizing debasement and fractional reserve. Above, we have discussed how inflation can be created independent of government, namely through the private falsification of money certificates. Such inflation, albeit widespread, is negligible from a quantitative point of view when compared to fiat inflation. The reason, as we have argued above, is that there are powerful forces at work cont contain private falsification within fairly narrow limits. First, falsifying money certificates is a tort, and counterfeiting, intentional falsification, is a criminal activity punishable by law. Second, once a falsification has been discovered, the market participants are likely to abandon the use of the false certifi certificates and begin to use another ones. Third, in the worst case of all, the market participants can demand payment in bullion and verify the fine content of metal by themselves. The legalization of false certificates removes the first of these three legitimations. Legalization can mean that the government declares a debased coin or a fractional reserve banknote to be a means of payment that every creditor is legally obliged to accept at par. We will deal with the case in some detail. But the legalization of false certificates can also come in a more elementary form, namely when the government becomes agnostic about the language of the country and thus refuses to enforce the laws. For example, it might adopt the point of view that the expression one ounce of gold is really just a string of letters that can be given just about any contractually binding meaning. It would follow that a mint can legally issue coins the feature of the imprint one ounce of gold, but which in fact contains just half an ounce or no gold at all. The government could also adopt such an agnostic point of view vis-a-vis -vis banknotes, or at least it could be use ambiguous imprints, such as the famous promise to pay. There is, of course, no such thing as a false certificate or an ambiguous certificate. Once the premise is accepted, the words have no objective meaning. For the sake of our readers, who on the preceding pages have discerned, uh, have discerned meanings where others might just see strings of letters or black points on white paper, we will nevertheless continue to speak of false certificates and ambiguous meanings. <laughs> All of such policies legalize false money certificates, if not in intention, then at least in fact. The present chapter deals with such cases. First of all, let us observe that the government's agnostic agnosticism is the, in these matters has in all known cases been rather self-serving. The legalization of false certificates usually occurred after the government itself has already debased the currency or because it planned to debase it or because it sought to obtain credit from fractional reserve banks. The result is always the same. Counterfeiting henceforth goes unpunished and thus the material incentives of counterfeiting develop a greater inflationary potential. However, as we have noticed above, on an otherwise free market, such, such policies very quickly lead to the some sort of the correction through the remaining liberty of action. The citizens, cause, cause, cautious of the widespread falsification and weary of the constant inflation under their laws, would start using money certificates that are produced abroad rather than using, say, coronas produced by their own prints. They might start using the duck, ducats of their neighboring countries, where the falsification of certificate is still a legal offense. In short, laws that legalize false money create more inflation than would otherwise have existed. But per se, they do not open the floodgates. However harmful and morally offensive such as legalization might be, it cannot create large-scale inflation. Quite the contrary, we should rather expect such, 
such legislation to have some deflationary effects. The reason is that the production of debased coin, even though it's not legal, takes time. It is impossible for the government, or for that matter, for any other private agent, agency, to replace the entire existing stock of coins in one stro stroke. It follows that the gradual introduction of new debased coins make the supply of these coins heterogeneous. Old coins, old sound coins, circulate side by side with the new debased coins. When the market participants realize what is happening, they will spend much more time distinguishing between old and new coins, or they may just well hoard all the old coins or sell them abroad and use only new coins for payments. But this means more or less drastic reductions of the coin supply available for exchange, fiat deflation. Again, this effect is likely to be dampened through the remaining liberty of action. As long as the competitive production of money certificates is still possible, the fiat deflation can be contained within fairly narrow limits. One thing is sure, however, the legalization of false certificates permanently increased the risk of being cheated in monetary exchange. Nicholas Erasmi wrote, and, and I quote, and so there is no certainty in a thing in which certainty is of the highest importance, but rather uncertain and disordered confusion to the prince's reproach. Nicholas Resmi in the Treatise on the Origin, Nature, Law, and Alteration of Money. Substitute for, to the world government for the word prince, and we have an accurate description of the fact. Buridan argued that the word prince is to be understood in such context, not in the sense of a single ruler, but as referring to all those who have the power to govern. That is Sir John Buridan in Extraid the Questions sur la politique de Aristotle. Oresmi also noted that official debasement would invite foreign counterfeits to seize the opportunity presented by the general confusion over the debased coinage, I quote, and thus, robbing, and thus rob the king of the profit which he thinks he is making. Uh, this is Oresmi in treaties again. Part two, the ethics of legalized falsification. We have em emphasized that the legalization of false money certificates, though harmful, is virtually insignificant from a quantitative point of view, at least in the comparison to the inflation impact of legal monopolies and legal tender laws. Nevertheless, the privilege is fundamental because it is the foundation of all other monetary privileges. It would seem impossible, for example, to establish legal tender laws in favor of some debased coin or some fractional reserve banknotes, in the latter, if the latter are per se illegal. And thus, it, if, it allows that the moral case for all other monetary privileges depend on the morality of legalized falsification. Nicholas Resmi describes the moral character of these practices is no, in no uncertain terms. It was for him a matter of course that imprints of the coin should be truthful according to the Ninth Commandment. To provide a justification for the practice of falsifying money certificates was impossible. The government could claim no exception. Quite to the contrary, Oresmi thought that the falsification of money certificates was particularly offensive. In the case, he said, and I quote, it is exceedingly detestable and disgraceful in a prince and to commit fraud, to debase his money, to call what is not gold, gold, and what is not pound, a pound, and so forth. Besides, it is his duty to condemn false coiners. How can he blush deep enough if that he found in him when, which in another he ought to punish by a disgraceful death? And that is again in his treaties. As a counterfeiter of the power as a confessor of the powerful, Oresmi knew only the well, only too well, the temptation of inflation. He therefore did not limit his ad ad admonition in the case of falsification, but condemned any alteration of existing monies whatsoever.
More precisely, Resmi charged that the government should never alter the money because the legitimacy of the alteration of money made a tyrannous government perfect. To be illicit, alterations of coins needed the consent of the entire community of money users. And even in the case, consent would not automatically provide legitimacy to the policy. For example, he argued that money should never be debased for regular revenue pur purposes. Only if the alteration provided the only means to deal with an emergency situation, such as a sudden attack by an overwhelming enemy. It could be illicit, provided it had the consent of the entire community. Oresmi also observed that the Pope will never grant the privilege of altering money, and that even if it were granted as an exception, it could always be revoked. And this is again in his treatise on the essentially identification or identical position of the late scholastics author Thomas de Mercado and Juan Mariana, see Alejandro Jafuen in A Faith and Liberty, the Economic Thought of the Lake Scholastics. Piers, thank you very much for joining me today in Chapter 8 on Legalized Falsifications of the Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Holzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much for joining me and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.